Hello everybody, I'm your host Hal Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organizations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Space Industry Podcast by Satsage. I'm joined today by Frank Tobin of nanosatellite manufacturer GOMSpace, a name you're probably familiar with in the industry. And we're going to discuss how companies in the space industry today are working with external partners in the supply chain at different levels and in different ways, and the kind of all important build versus buy decisions that can crop up at many different stages of a mission's development. So hi, Frank, welcome to the Space Industry Podcast. Very pleased to have you with us today. I I wanted just to begin with, if you could give us a bit of an overview and introduction uh, to your background and your experience in the space industry, as well as your current focus at GOMSpace. Thanks for having me, Hal. Sure, let me give you a brief uh, synopsis of my background. I'm an engineer by trade and education. At one point in my career, I designed control systems for exoatmospheric missiles and over the years, I've worked with large system integrators like Lockheed Martin and Talus on very complex integration programs. And my mission in, in, in all of these cases has always been to find the best technology to solve a problem, whether it was for the government agency and or a commercial entity. Right. Fantastic. That's um, really interesting and a great, great background there, obviously. So as I mentioned, I want to discuss the build versus buy decision that's often faced by engineers and in three specific areas based on some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry and that we're seeing people discuss in the industry. Now, first up is software defined radio systems. Okay, so with mission performance and versatility being really increasingly important metrics for engineers, we've seen lots of interest in software defined radios and other software defined equipment. In your view, What does an engineer need to consider when deciding whether to build an SDR, a software-defined radio, versus partnering with an expert provider? And in particular, I was interested in how the software development aspect of it works. Great question. For me, the first challenge is, for any company, is I don't believe that you can be good at everything. So you have to pick and choose what you're good at. And if you you try to have too many products in your portfolio, some of them are going to suffer. So the important thing, in my mind, is to focus on the things that you believe as a company you do best. And one of the things that we absolutely do best at GOMSpace is the SDR, the Software Defined Radio. We also excel at interfacing with our customers to provide the software support and the integration pieces to make an SDR work with their overall system. At the end of the day, what does that really mean? Um, It is pretty easy today to grab an evaluation kit from the FPGA or SOC vendor and get a quick start on the development using that. But the the problem is this makes it attractive at the beginning or the start with the latest and greatest. But the problem is when you end in a situation where you need a quick transformation and transform your development setup into a flight-worthy hardware. That then becomes the issue. Quality, for the flight quality hardware will always take time to ensure your system is robust and it performs the way you need it to re- perform when it's in space, especially when it comes to the thermal performances and the electromagnetic compatibilities that exist. So. Using products that are proven across a range of uh, missions ensures, in my mind, that the SDR solution can can perform for you optimally in the space environment and comes with what I like to call, quote unquote, the tricks of the trade. We've been doing this and we were the first ones to put a satellite in orbit. And these tricks of the trade ensure that you have a stable and flexible platform when you're in space. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, obviously that makes sense if the goal is versatility, the use of equipment that has been tested in different mission settings and scenarios. It's logical to to consider that as part of your decision. 
I wanted to then focus on the ground segment next. Now, there's various different operating models that can be used to communicate with satellites from the ground. And we've discussed these on previous podcasts, from right from building and managing your own entire facility, staffing and all the everything that goes along with that, to purchasing scheduled ground segment as a service access, which may be just for a, a, a brief window when you require it. And But there's a lot that goes into that. And without an effective ground segment, you have a worthless piece of space hardware. So... What do you think are the key factors that engineers or mission designers need to consider when determining whether to build or buy with regards to the ground segment? Yeah, there are a number of different companies, as you've alluded to and suggested, that are doing port. There's a number of companies that, 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 that just take the data from the satellite and move it down to the ground. But then what really happens with the data once it gets to the ground, typically you might have to build a whole ground operation, a system, or a facility to support this effort. What we have done is developed a system called HOOP, which is hands-off operational platform. What we've done is we've integrated all the aspects of a ground management system into a total ground uh, management software platform and put that total system in a software package that actually resides on the cloud. In today's environment, where new ground or new commercial ground stations are shooting up like mushrooms, and there's uh, obviously there's a large selection of ground station network services to choose from, and you suggested that uh, with your opening comments. The business case for uh, for a company to establish your own ground station is it really is not very good. With a Hoops software solution. It doesn't require the building of a large facility or ground system or control center in order to have the benefits of a total management operation system for satellites. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think reducing kind of the complexity of decision making, the number of the expertise that are required in your mission team are all the sort of factors that can go into deciding whether or not to use a system such as who. So, yeah, thank you for that. That's really interesting for engineers to consider. And I think the, f- the final area I wanted to ask about is constellation development. Now, we hear a lot about this. It cap- always captures the attention, the imagination in, in the popular press, as well as the, the, the specialist press in cyberspace. But in any business that's serious about deploying a constellation today is likely to have a certain level of experience and funding, at least for the first phase. Although that's not always the case, but this is likely. And it's also likely that they've got some innovation or particular end user applications in mind, which is their, their reason for having their own constellation in the first place, which might need added security, whether that's because they're defense related or whether they're handling sensitive information or whether just because they, it's such a powerful innovation that they're worried about people taking the IP. So building everything in house seems attractive, seems logical from the outside. There are also new manufacturing and testing solutions on the market, sort of things like rapid pro- rapid prototyping, digital engineering and communications and specialized test benches. All of these can help because these can enable a constellation to develop in-house. And we've seen concepts of satellite factories around the world cropping up. But designing, building, testing whole satellites, particularly more than one satellite takes time. And as the industry is getting more competitive, deployments are expected to happen on shorter timescales. The more rapid deployment is important. So how should Constellation designers try and weigh up all these different factors involved in building versus buying where a Constellation is involved? Very interesting question. And what I've seen over the years in the industry is that most people are really, at the end of the day, bringing to the table a payload solution. And then, for whatever reason, they believe they have to build a satellite around their payload. And when they take that to investors, that costs a lot of money to develop the entire satellite and then integrate your payload into that satellite. And and again, trying to do everything in-house may work as long as the technology is relatively simple. And and many of the first satellites were built in-house. So were the first bicycles, cars, aircrafts, and computers, right? But But then the market reaches a certain volume and technology investment starts coming in, 
And it's very difficult as a single company to master all the required subsystems and to lead the market at the same time. And the perfect example of this is in the microcomputers early integrators like Commodore, Atari, ZX Spectrum, Apple, all went bankrupt or close to when buying a computer in the 90s was all about getting the newest components, the Intel Pentium, the, the NVIDIA, or the 3Com. And the integrators at that point in time became logistics operators like Dell and HP rather than engineering houses. So the question, I, I believe the question you really, you should really be asking yourself as a new payload provider with innovative technology and innovative concept is, who can I rely on to be my strategic partner? Who can actually build the satellites, has the track record for building satellites? Not only do they have the track record for building the satellite, do they have the pedigree of being at a technology TRL level nine and have more flights under their belt than any other provider relative to in-orbit satellites. To me, that's, that's one of the key. And then you couple that with a true system integrator like SAIC, who's been a system integrator for the Department of Defense and commercial agencies for many years. They are considered one of the best system integrators for technology that exists today. But that together, you put those two together, our track record, SAIC is an integrator. Now you have a strategic partner that can build your satellite, set up your mission architecture, and deliver a successful mission. If you have a partner like that and you take that to an investor, which is really what you're trying to get your investor comfortable with your unique innovative payload, I believe in the end, you set yourself up in a position where you get the funds you need at a lower cost, i.e. you don't have to give up as much equity, and investors aren't coming to the table these days just to find a science project, just to fund a science project. So you have to basically differentiate yourself and show that you have the capability to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver. So we're at a point now where investors want to know what their return on investment is going to be, and if there's a real business model there. Too many entrepreneurs today come to the investors with an innovative solution, but at the end of the day, they have not validated the business model on the front end. And even generating revenue is meaningless if you don't have a clear path to profitability. When I look at the industry, I see us transitioning out of this IOD phase to where you might have three to five satellites in orbit together, but now you want to expand uh, that into a full constellation. In order to get the capital, you need to launch it to, to you need to launch a full constellation. You really have to have a business model that you validated and that the investors feel comfortable with. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting angle to take. I think I was coming at the question from an engineering point of view. Can you build what you need in-house in order to deploy a constellation? Chances are you hire the right people, you go through the right training programs, you, whatever else you can, but should you is, yeah, is what you, you've answered there. Well, it depends on your capital, your approach to investment, your approach to risk and, and everything. So there's a lot that goes into this decision. I think that's some, yeah, pretty clear message there that for, for those companies who want to provide a professional service, this is a big deal. How you get a professional constellation into orbit that's reliable, that's can be maintained on the ground and can be upgraded where, where necessary, I think is really, is really key. Now, we've talked a, a lot in the previous few questions about the reasons why engineers would really, should really consider partnering on specific aspects of different missions or the, or the entire mission. I wondered also, in your opinion, what do you think engineers should be building in-house wherever possible? And in these processes, what are some of the common kind of trends or problems that you've seen? Maybe misconceptions about AIT steps or companies lacking in capabilities and skills or just any sort of patterns you think you might have seen in their components and subsystems that engineers should be building in-house? Along the same lines of, of the thoughts that I shared with you above or before this conversation in, in the previous question, how companies and engineers should focus on developing technology that makes their satellites able to provide a differentiating service. That's what's key, right? You want to be able to differentiate yourself. That means focusing on a on payload development. 
right? Specific niche functions that are required to support special missions and data integration with their actual end users. And so at the end of the day, you can always buy a satellite kit. GOMSpace sells kits that would have the bus, the power source, the power system solution, the SDR radio, some antennas, an attitude control system. But then it's up to an integrator to make all those components work together in the satellite with their payload. And making that work is why, in my opinion, you need a true system integrator like SAIC. They have a they, we've got a they've got a brand new AI and T facility that is being built in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. They're going to open that up in October 31st of this year. And so, from our perspective, with us providing them a kit and SAIC integrating it the GOMSpace way, which obviously is tried and true from all of our experiences over the years. And, and this allows us to continue on being the, having the most number of successful flights in orbit than just about any other company out there. Excellent. So focus on that key differentiating value, uh, the key innovation uh, that you can bring to the market. And uh, yeah, use what's available to, to get it into orbit and to operate it effectively, I guess, is the take-home message here. <laughs> Fantastic. So you mentioned the the facility opening up and how October 31st you mentioned. So we'll be sure to keep a, keep an eye out for that. Good luck with the launch and with that uh, initiative moving forward. I wondered just finally what your predictions are for the wider space industry in the next, I don't know, I always ask some version of this, maybe five to 10 years. And what are you most excited about? Where do you think GOM space is going to have the biggest impact? I think we're, we are very quickly moving away from the IOD and we're getting to the point now, from my perspective, where the numbers have to justify the ends. And what does that mean? And that the ends are constellations. As soon as we get to the point where we have a valid business model for a constellation solution, that solution is going to start being deployed. And at the end of the day, for me, technology will lead the way in enabling new use cases and increasing performance from generation to generation. There will be, in my mind, fewer system integrators altogether, but each, but with each operating at a higher volumes and with dependencies on key satellite components. Personally, I believe that GOMSpace, coupled with our strategic partner SAIC, is probably in the best position to deliver on large-scale constellation and deliver that capability rapidly to the market and then sustain that capability as we have to remove satellites by attrition from orbit. So I think at the end of the day, our South Space SAIC team is in a very strong position to help people meet the reality of their constellation deployments. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that's a, a great place to wrap up. just want to say thank you for all the insights you've shared today that engineers and mission designers, I believe, will find very useful in trying to make those critical build versus buy decisions at different stages of their missions, of their mission plans. And yeah, we'd wish you all the best with the company and with the new initiative moving forward. For the audience out there, we'll also share some further links and notes uh, in the show notes uh, with the podcast. And yeah, we'd like to say thank you again to Frank. We'll be back again soon with uh, another episode thank you very much thank you for listening to this episode of the space industry by satsearch i hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit we'll be back soon with more in-depth behind the scenes insights from private space businesses in the meantime you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments to stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use.